Hello all. Welcome to our first series in the spring webinars for Maryland Online. Uh, if you haven't done so already, would you please sign in the chat with your name and institution? Our first speaker is Juliana White. She has over 15 years of online teaching and course designing experience and remains passionate about designing and engaging pedagogically sound online classes. She is also a strong advocate for the use of humor and pop culture in the classroom. I have been in several of her seminars and they are always interactive and entertaining. If you have any questions during the presentation, please put them in the chat and I will let Juliana know what they are. Uh, welcome Juliana and you should be able to share your screen and, and go from here. Thank okay, you. are you guys seeing my opening slide? Are we good? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, okay, I warned everyone, there's an ice storm in Buffalo. I am working from my house on one screen, so I can't see the chat. I've got Carla for that. Um, but hi, I'm Juliana. I am up here in Buffalo where, believe it or not, we're having more weather. Go figure. <laughs> um, so I'm iced into my house and really excited to be here with you guys today. So hello to everyone that made it to the live session and hello to all of you that are going to watch this on the recording afterwards. I'm here today to talk about different ways that we can use video to enhance our online classes and honestly even enhance our on-ground classes where we have online components. It works for that too. So let's just jump into these five ways that we're about to talk about. We have course navigation videos. We're going to talk about weekly instructor welcome and announcements. We're gonna get into a little bit of micro lectures, some video discussions, video feedback. And you'll notice there are six boxes in here because I'm giving you a bonus because I do bonus assignments um, that are really fun and also use videos. So it's a five plus one for you today. Um, but to back up a little bit, just a little bit more about me. Carl gave you a good little brief intro. Um, but my day job, I'm an instructional designer at Duville University, and I did see some of my colleagues pop in there. Oh my gosh, see, this is what happens when you work from home. My slides are skittering all over the place, and now I'm just frozen. <laughs> Still trying to back up. There we are. Now we're back about me. Um, so I'm an instructional designer by day, and I'm an adjunct online instructor by night. A little bit of a superhero complex. And I love the duality of those roles because each one makes me better at the other. Being an instructional designer, it's helpful when I'm still working on the inside and I still feel like I am in the field and I can see the trends and I can feel how things go. COVID was something you really had to feel from the inside to understand what your students were going through and even what your colleagues were going through. And I feel like that made me a better instructional designer. So I do try to keep both of those roles going for myself at the same time. And honestly, now working at two different universities, I'm in two different platforms. I am in Blackboard and in Canvas, which I think has also made me a stronger designer. So I do teach out of the Department of Education at Madai University, a lot of that stale research and writing stuff. And for me, interactive classes are really important because they can find my curriculum a little bit scary, um, intimidating, terrifying, any of those things you want to say about it. So the more engaging we can make that curriculum, the better off it is for all of us. Um, so that's where a lot of these things came from. I have always searched for ways to make my classes engaging. Um, like Carla said, she's been to some of my presentations and I do presentations about humor and, and videos and just different ways to make online curriculum come alive. When I first began to teach, obviously I was a classroom teacher. And when I took my first online class, my biggest fear was how am I going to replicate that energy that I have in a classroom online? Because, you know, I would walk into a class like it was the beginning of a stand-up routine. I didn't care if I was that nasty jingle they couldn't get out of their head because those jingles are annoying, but gosh, you remember those. I was okay being that. And I really struggled on how I was going to do that online. So as I have grown with the industry, honed that craft a little bit more. That's where we come up with these tricks on how to really keep people engaged. So today we're going to talk about how to use video to do that. We'll see if my slide deck behaves now. Okay, so what are our goals today? 
We want to make sure that we have regular and substantive interaction in our courses. We all know how important RSI is in the field, and we want to make sure that oh, I'm about to have a dog jump on my lap. Hello, everyone. This is Lulu. <laughs> You're going to see the top of her head again, working from home today. We need RSI to make sure that we meet our federal regulations, but also to make sure that our classes are just as engaging as they can possibly be. So engagement is a very big tool for us, and we want to make sure that we can replicate a sense of community in our courses. So many online students that I talk to are afraid of feeling disengaged and isolated. It's stressful enough. Going to school, you don't want to feel like you're doing that on an island. You want to make sure that you can still feel that cohesiveness that you have in a traditional classroom. So we're constantly looking for ways to, to replicate that online. So today we're going to talk about how to use video to do that. But before we even get into the strategies, let's talk a little bit of tech because I've talked to a lot of instructors who say, I'd love to use video more, but I'm really afraid of the technology. How exactly am I going to do that? So the first thing I'm going to suggest is to look for whatever recording tools you already have inside your LMS. Your institution might have Panopto, Kaltura, Echo 360. These are all tools that are built right into Blackboard, Canvas, Brightspace, things that have already been paid for and that you can already use. And the bonus of that is that your students can use those too, because today we're not just talking about how we are going to spit videos at our students, but also how they're going to use video to interact with us. So using tools built into the LMS gives us and our students the opportunity to use something that is built in, already paid for, and we can easily teach them how to use. I also like to use some outside tools depending on what I'm recording, what my end game is. Screencast-O-Matic, Screencastify, I've heard a lot of instructors say that these are their go-to favorites. I do actually pay for Screencast-O-Matic. You can do 15 minutes of free video on Screencast-O-Matic with their free account. Um, I, I do a lot of video, so I do tend to pay for their other one, but for somebody that's just doing it here and there, the free accounts for both of these are fine and will serve you well. And what I really like about both of these platforms is that when you are doing a screen recording, which is where we're going to get into our recording tips right here, when you're doing a screen recording on either one of those, it will, Screencast-O-Matic gives you this great little yellow circle that follows your cursor around, and it makes the person watching your video able to follow what your cursor is doing. And if it's a more technical video that you're recording for them, it's really helpful to see where their cursor's traveling. Sometimes the little arrow that you'll get in some of the built-in ones isn't quite enough. Screencast-O-Matic gives you a nice big yellow circle that I really like. So honestly, my secret is I will record a lot of things in Screencast-O-Matic, save them as an MP4, and then upload them into Panopto. So I'm still using the built-in tools for Canvas or Blackboard um, and upload them into my courses that way. But doing it first in Screencast-O-Matic just gives me that little extra flair that I like to have in my video. Um, so that's my first recording tip. If you're going to record your screen, make sure that you have something that records your cursor on it because it's imperative for the learner, especially if you're doing something I'm an instructional designer. If you're doing something where you're teaching them how to use something and it's important that they follow your workflow, having that cursor in front of them um, <laughs> makes all the difference in the world. Other recording tips. You don't have to have really high-tech equipment to make these videos. I'll have people ask me about external microphones and, and high-tech cameras. It's great if you have access, but if you don't, it's not a deal breaker. What you have built into your laptop or your desktop is going to do you just fine. So my tips are more things like lighting and placement of where your webcam is. No one wants to look up your nose when you're recording the video. So make sure that the camera is placed firmly in front of you and that it's not looking down at you or looking up at you. So just make sure that you take a good look at what the viewer is going to see and make sure that you have decent lighting. 
I tend to do this thing where I'll sit down in my dining room to record a video and I'll have my giant window right behind me and it bleeds me out. And I always have to remember that I need to shift it so that I don't have backlight that makes me look like a ghost um, or that it's so dark that they can't see me. So good lighting is also imperative to what you're doing. Um, and go fun places. I am a huge proponent for personality and adventure. Online classes and online videos don't have to be stale. We're going to talk in a few minutes about letting your personality shine through and recording videos in different places are the first way to accomplish that. So take it outside, use the natural light, sit on your porch and record a video, go to a park. I like to sit on campus for my online students. I love to go out into campus and shoot a video from there because it makes them feel connected to that campus culture that they're not physically standing in. So those are just some things to keep in mind as you're putting your video together. But the moral of the story, don't feel like you need anything high tech to do any of these because I certainly do not have any of those things myself. Now let's talk about closed captions because these are ADA necessary and not just ADA necessary for students who need closed captions for an accommodation, I have found that a large proponent of students, including my kids, like to watch things with the closed captions on because it's just another reinforcement tool. And we're doing them a disservice if we are not turning on the closed captions. I will say that Panopto has the best talk to text closed captioning I have ever worked with. I That's another reason why I tend to record my videos in Screencast-O-Matic and then upload them to Panopto because their closed captioning tool is excellent. Screencast-O-Matic has one, it's just not quite as good. So speaking clearly and slowly, which as you can tell is a problem for me sometimes, but speaking slowly and clearly in Panopto, it will catch 90% of what I'm saying. And then I just have to go back through and edit things like proper names, especially if you're in a discipline that has a lot of technical words, if you are in something medical, scientific, um, if you have words that are difficult, you, you should anticipate going back and fixing those. But please, 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 with your videos, turn on the closed captioning function because um, it is necessary and helpful. Okay, do we have any questions out there before I get into our very first kind of video? I usually have somebody that wants to talk tech about something. I don't see any in the chat, Juliana. Okay, then we're gonna keep going. So the first kind of video that we're gonna talk about are course navigation videos. What do I mean by that? By course navigation video, I mean when students come to campus, for an on-ground experience. When, when we're recruiting students and they're coming through admissions and they come to campus, isn't the first thing we do walk them around campus and give them a tour and show them where all the important things are? That's what I mean by a course navigation video because so many of these online courses look different. Even if your institution has a common template they like to use, it's not always going to be identical. And online students struggle with knowing where to go and they worry about what am I missing? Am I seeing everything? There's a level of stress that they have entering any new online class, as I'm sure we as learners do whenever we enter any new program. Am I going to be able to find my way? So a course navigation video, um, if you're a Quality Matters institution, you know they want to know that you've shown the student how to use this course. And a course navigation video is a prime way to do that. So what I do is go into Screencast-O-Matic, as you'll see in my lower picture down there, you'll see that yellow circle I was talking about that I get from Screencast-O-Matic. It shows you the little hand and it has the yellow circle around it so that the students can trace the path of the cursor and I walk them through the course. So I narrate it, you'll see it in the picture on the top. I actually have my little thumbnail. I do the picture and picture so they have that connection with me as a person speaking to them in the bottom of the frame. And then I screen share and give them a tour of the class while I talk about it. And it's a great chance to show them where everything is located, 
talk through how the weekly modules are going to be set up. Every week you're going to see this and then you're going to go here and we're going to do one of these. And, you know, this is how you submit an assignment. Walk them through how to do something. Go to your practice student and show them how to submit an assignment or how to go on a discussion board. Just a really quick video tour of where all the important things are. Where's the mail? Where are the announcements? How do I find my assignment? Because our students struggle enough with our curriculum, we don't want them struggling with our technology. If we can head that off immediately, we've taken one of those barriers away and immediately put them at ease. So that is how I always like to start a course. And I put it in a few different places. I will send it to them in my welcome announcement. I always like to have my courses open at least a week before the semester starts. So at their leisure, students can come in, take a look around, check out the materials, and feel confident before classes start and everything avalanches on them. So I will send out a welcome announcement about a week before classes start, welcoming everybody to class. It'll have a welcome video in it, what we'll talk about in a second. And it will also have the course navigation video linked into the announcement. And then I will tell them where that's located in the course, which is usually in my getting started module which is also quality matters, something that you want to have in there. So I will make sure that they can't miss it and make sure to tell them if they have questions, you know, to get back to me. And I will field questions in the beginning of I watch the video. I'm a little uncomfortable about this particular thing. So um, course navigation video, number one place to start. It's the first interaction we have with our students. It is definitely the putting your best foot forward way to begin your course and make them feel at ease. It introduces them to me as a person. They're hearing my voice. They're seeing my face. And they're learning about our course from the source, which is the best way to do it, not blindly floundering through the pages of the course looking for things. It, it's a little bit of hand-holding. It's the admissions team walking them around campus, showing them where everything is before courses start. Okay, so me telling you that these work is one thing. I always like to go back to the source itself, which are the students. What do the students say about it? So I've started collecting things from my student opinion surveys at the end of the semester so that I can throw them into these presentations we do. And you're not just taking my word for it, you're actually hearing from the horse's mouth how they like these videos and what they say about them. So, you know, the first person here says, you know, day one, I was shown where the required materials were found. That's a big deal. Or, you know, I learned how the Blackboard classroom works. Those are very important things for our students. You know, the fact that they were still thinking about that at the end of the semester when they filled out my student opinion survey really goes to show how far that went with them because that was 15 weeks later they still remembered how well those videos introduced them to the course uh excuse so, me juliana yes we have a question are the navigation videos needed in in-person courses um yes because any good in-person course is going to have its um, at least emergency content in your lms and if you're going to use your LMS for anything, whether it's just here's my syllabus or, you know, <laughs> it's Buffalo, we're closed for the snow, I'm going to put your lecture online, um, or heck, it's a global pandemic and we're all working from home. If you're using your course for any reason at all, if there's any sort of content in there, I would always start with a general navigation video because, you know, even the smallest of things, I think it's important to show them where they are. So, yes, as a best practice, I would say it should be in anyone. Great question. Thank you. Yeah, okay, and, and let's move on to number two. Oh, also, one more. Okay. I was let's just going to say, we also had a, um, uh, our first day of school was canceled. So the students didn't even know how to get into it. So that's a very good thing to have for that, too. Yeah. And even for your on ground classes, like I said, how I open my online courses a week ahead of time, even for on ground, I would, I would send an announcement out and say, you know, our course starts next. Meantime, have a look at our online components. Here they are, you know, here's the syllabus so that you can, you know, get a jump start. So yeah, all good things. Okay, welcome videos. These are my absolute favorite. 
As you can tell from all of those cockamamie pictures of me on the screen, I love welcome videos. I love the personality of the welcome videos and they're my absolute favorite part of teaching online. I do these every single week uniquely for every course because even if I'm teaching the same course in different sections, you know how all your courses have a different personality. You know that, you know, even if you're Let's not hope we get off track and are behind in one rather than the other, but they still all have their unique personalities and even unique struggles as they're turning assignments in because, you know, people in a course tend to work together. So when things go a little off kilter, they, you know, kind of all skew in the same direction in one section and you might not be seeing that in another one. So I like to make unique videos every week for my courses. Um, sometimes I'm lucky and they're in the same spot and I can reuse it for a couple of sections, but you do what you got to do. And I use these for multiple reasons. Number one, I like the weekly touch point. I like to remind them every week that I'm a real person who really cares. I'm really grading their assignments. And, you know, if I'm real, they also need to be real. If I'm checking in on them, they better be checking in on our course. So I use these in my weekly announcements. I will send a link to the video in the weekly announcement and I'll do a bare minimum written announcement because I really want them to watch the video. And I always make sure in my video that I say week, any pertinent information, that I wrap up the previous week, that I'll tell them, you know, things that maybe went a little bit awry in their assignments, you know, common mistakes that I'm seeing. I teach APA, I teach research and writing. Um, for graduate students. And the APA is still a killer even in grad school. So we'll do a lot of APA tips. And I'll wrap up the common mistakes I've seen from the previous week. And I'll talk about all the things I loved from the previous week, like all of the great things that I saw. And students get so excited. When I, you know, a video comes out and I've specifically mentioned, you know, someone who turned in something that really caught my eye, just like in class, when you see a student's eyes light up when you call them out for something good, that doesn't change when you're online. They still like the recognition and the connectedness of it all. So I will always wrap up the week before and then I will preview the week that's coming. And what I like to do is give them tips for assignments in these videos that they can't get anywhere else. They watch my videos because they want the insider tips. This is where I give them the good secret hints and the things to look out for, you know, and the tips for their assignments that they won't get if they don't watch my video. So it's really a win-win for them and, um, and for me. We're building community as well as getting information across. My tips for these videos is to just be you. Don't worry about perfection. That's not what these welcome videos are about. These welcome videos are like the kind of chatting that you do before class and after class with your students. Though those things that we miss when we're teaching online because, you know, we're not getting the informal conversation that we get as we chat before class. So, I kind of look at these like that where it's a little bit less structured and a little bit more personality where I make the quirky points. As you'll see from these videos, um, I have a dog on my lap. That was during the pandemic. <laughs> and, and he did a lot of work with me during the pandemic. Um, the one next to that, I'm in Walt Disney World. I was presenting, I think Carla was there. I was presenting at Anthology Together 2022. Um, I, was in, I was in Disney to present there and I was still teaching at the time. And I was teaching a faculty course. I was actually teaching a course on online teaching. And my theme for the course had been how teaching online is like learning a different instrument. Just because you can stand in class and be a really great instructor, like someone who can stand and sing the national anthem perfect, doesn't mean you can sit down at the piano and play the national anthem. Doesn't mean you can sit down at a keyboard and teach your class as effectively as you do in person. It's a different instrument. Singing, piano, different instrument. Talking to a class, teaching online, different instrument. It had been my theme. So I find myself in Disney and with these giant instruments behind me, I'm like, oh, this is perfect. <laughs> so I did a whole spiel about, you know, learning their different instrument. 
Yes. Um, down below, I'm actually in the quad at Madai University and I'm juggling. It was a thing about keeping all your balls in the air because we had so many things going on that week that I, I resorted to circus performance and did a shtick about keeping your balls in the air. Um, like I said, I do these announcements every week and Sunday is the beginning of our week. So it was easy. Easter Sunday, and I did not forget about them, hence the ridiculous Easter bonnet and all the peeps on a plate, because I wanted to let them know that uh, they did not have time off that week. They still had assignments due the week of Easter, and so I uh, ran home from church and recorded them that, so they knew I was still out there. Uh, there's one, another one of me sitting outside at campus, and then, of course, my snowball blizzard one, which is one of my favorite videos. I actually talked one of my children into going outside with me during this blizzard because they, my students were just starting their research projects, and my point was that starting your research project is like building a snowman, and if you don't have a good thesis statement, if you don't have good packing snow for the base of your snowman, everything above it crumbles. So I did a whole analogy to constructing a research project like you construct a snowman as I stood outside in this blizzard. It was cold, but it was hilarious. And then at the end, my son pelted me with snowballs because you always have to be prepared for the unexpected. <laughs> so it was a great video. And my students afterwards were so funny because they're like, if you actually stood outside in that blizzard to make this video for us, I really feel like my project has to be really good because I need to put as much effort into it as you just put into making that video. <laughs> so, so it worked. And then my final picture right there is me with a hula hoop. I do pull out the circus tricks a lot. Um, and that was the action research cycle. It was our last day of class where we were superheroes, hence the Superman t-shirt. Um, and they had completed their circle of life. They had completed the research cycle. And so I did a whole thing with that. So these welcome videos, they can be a little bit silly which me, I'm goofy, as any of my colleagues will tell you, if that's not you, that's fine. I'm not telling you that you have to be a stand-up comic. I'm saying be you. Do what works for you, because the most important thing that you can do for your students is be memorable. And what's more memorable than being authentically yourself? So whatever that is, you find your niche and you go with that. If you're more serious, you know, you show them that if you're really caring, that's what comes out. So find your lane for these videos and make them memorable and make them memorable by being yourself. That is, uh, that is my best advice for these videos. Um, okay, are we doing good? Nothing in the chat so far besides everybody thinking, wow, she's a little bit of a wackadoodle look at all these videos. No, everything's good. <laughs> okay. So student comments from these, um, again, end of the semester, things they always comment on. This one, they, if you look at the words, the human touch, the personalized feel, feeling connected and staying informed. They liked the information, but they also liked the way it made them feel, how it took an asynchronous class and still made it feel like they were part of a community. I've actually had students tell me that they feel more connected to my online class than any of their other classes, just because of the way that we work at it and how they've become so close with these friends that they've made in this online class that it, it's really helped build those relationships for them that are helping see them through the rest of their graduate program. And we know how invaluable that is, how much a community helps everyone. And as silly as it sounds, Putting these videos in there and showing them who I am and inviting them into the wacky world of Juliana White helps create a community. They buy in. And once they buy into me, they buy into the curriculum and they buy into each other. And it is absolutely invaluable. Okay, so let's talk about micro lectures. These, not as goofy. These are things where we can deliver content and we can use these in a fully online class, in a hybrid class, or in an on-ground class where we just want to put some reinforcement online for people. 
my advice for micro lectures is that they should only be about five or six minutes. We've all read the research about chunking material, about not overwhelming our students. I mean, I know I'm like that. If I, you know, I'm trying to learn something, YouTube, you know, it teaches you how to do anything. If I want to learn how to, you know, fix my sink, which just happened to me, <laughs> am I going to pull up the five minute video or the 45 minute video? Let's start with the five minute one and see if that walks me through how to reattach this pipe. <laughs> so same theory with our micro lectures. Take your material and chunk it into five or six minute bits that the students can go back to as they have time and revisit when it works for them. Ways that we can use these micro lectures, we can use them before class, almost like a flipped classroom kind of thing. We can use them before class to introduce material or, or mainly to share a story. Think of how often we do that when we're in a real class and we'll stand you know, in, in front of our classroom and we'll tell this little personal story you know, with us in this material. Those are things we don't necessarily do when we're typing an introduction into our module. We're not like, and then one time I was doing this. We don't do that in our online introduction, but that's something that we can do in a video right before um, in a micro lecture. So we can do an introduction, we can share a story. We can use micro lectures after class to reinforce concepts, to answer common questions, or even provide a little bit more supplemental information, you know, to go a little bit more beyond, make it even more of a teachable moment. So we can use micro lectures before and after class. And by class online, that would be a module or in real life, it would be when they're walking in and out of your classroom. We can still use these micro lectures to deliver our content in ways that's gonna help reinforce the material for them and give them things to use for review afterwards. These are great things for students to go back and look at before a test is coming up, or I didn't quite catch that. You know, I mean, we have students that say from a live class, I'm gonna go and listen to that as soon as we're done because it's gonna reinforce what I just did. I mean, I remember when I was in school, I would take a whole ton of notes in class, but it was overwhelming. I loved it when I had 15 minutes after class where I could just sit down and reread through all of those and really try to make it sink in. That's what we can use these micro lectures for, whether we're in person or not, we can use it for concept reinforcement. You know, which you see me standing there with the APA manual because, you know, we're desperately trying to get these rules down. So micro lectures, not as silly, not as informal as the welcome videos. These are more content related and content delivery of things that we want them to know. We can put as many articles and video links and, and website links into our online curriculum as we want. And those are all great ways to deliver information. YouTube is, is immeasurably helpful when we want them to watch how something is. Um, send them to a simulation. Those are all great things in an online class. There's still no substitute for your instructor standing in front of you, talking about it and giving it to the, in your own words. And I know a lot of instructors who like to kind of tag team these in their online courses and maybe have a guest speaker come in and do a micro lecture that they'll put into their online course. Because I know when I'm teaching statistics, sometimes I feel like I'm just running in circles and my students really aren't getting it. And then someone else can say exactly what I've been saying. And they're like, oh, that's what she meant. <laughs> darn it, I said that. But sometimes you just need someone else to say it or say the same thing in maybe a different way that I haven't thought of. And they're like, oh, that's what she meant. Okay. So think about having a guest come in and do a micro lecture, you know, do it with your colleagues. Um, I'll do, I'll do a little micro lecture for your course. You can do one for mine. Um, we have a lot of instructors that do that. And I think that that's a great thing. You know, when I'm talking about connectedness and building relationships, it doesn't just have to be about you. We're a campus community. You know, introduce your colleagues, introduce other voices and other faces because it's so valuable to have that other perspective. Or like I said, in statistics, there's only one way to get these things done, but just hearing somebody else say it sometimes, you know, maybe they're, they've heard me so often that it's hard to hear. 
So it's like how your kids behave better when they go to somebody else's house. Having that guest speaker come in and just do it that way um, sometimes is, is the trick and the shakeup they need, especially toward the beginning of the semester. So micro lectures, five or six minutes. That's my, that's my big thing for that one. Um, and as far as these students in my asynchronous course liked this because it was proactive. So again, they thought that the tactic was helpful, um, especially in the ones that were asynchronous. And again, being proactive because these are already in there. These I don't record, sometimes I do, but usually I will pre-populate these into a course before the semester starts, um, which is where their proactive word came from. Video discussions. I started using these maybe two years ago now and absolutely love them. And it's been interesting to watch. I will side note that two years ago when I first started doing these, my students were so uncomfortable with them. And I've watched over the past couple of years, students get more and more comfortable with being recorded online. I don't know if that's a result of the pandemic because so many people had to start doing things this way, that their comfort level has just risen because of the world that we live in. Um, or it's just one of those things that as a society is evolving with our learners because so many more things are going in that direction. Um, but I use video discussions in my course. So um, instead of having a discussion board where I put the prompt and they type their, you know, 10 to 14 sentences and then reply to each other. Instead of having a typed response to the prompt, I have them record a verbal response to the prompt. I still have them do written replies. Um, that's instructor choice, but I still do like to have that dichotomy of I'm talking, I'm writing, targeting all those learning styles. Um, but it's a new twist on a best practice. Obviously, we know with RSI and all of those other interaction things that we need for our courses to meet standards that we have to have something like discussions in our courses. And doing those via video is a great way, again, to make students feel connected. And I find that we can get so much deeper into a discussion when they are actually hearing their classmates' voices. And I tend to tell my students as we work through. In the beginning, I tell them it's okay if they want to write out a script because they're nervous or work from an outline. But as we get more into the semester and we're talking about deeper concepts, right? Like their, their prompt this week, they're talking about multicultural issues and culturally responsive teaching because I have all the master's level teachers right now. So culturally responsive teaching is something that they can discuss so much better when they're doing it through a video. My students are all Canadian. You know, here in Buffalo, we're really close to the Canadian border. So uh, my students are all Canadians who are getting certified to teach in the United States and Canada at the same time. And usually in a class of Canadians, they are such a beautiful melting pot that I will have students that from at least seven different countries in my class. And it, the conversations that we get on this topic are so riveting when I hear about where they've lived and how they grew up and how education was in their culture and, and how they want to reach all of those students now you know that they're a Canadian, but they see students of all different backgrounds because they have such a unique perspective on that that I couldn't possibly have. Um, so the video discussions are so rich for content like that, and I, I, it's a prompt I've always used, and it the the level is so so much higher now that we're doing those through video as opposed to when they were written. So new twist on a best practice, and it brings that RSI to another another level. As I just said, they're so much more engaging, and it engages a different learning style. You know, you have students that simply do not enjoy writing or their writing skills are not as strong as maybe their oral presentation skills. Or on the other hand, maybe you have students who do not have good oral presentation skills. And in my case, I'm teaching the teachers. These are all people who are going out into the world to lead the next generation. 
we need to make sure that they can get their public speaking skills to the level that they need to be. And really, no matter what your discipline, aren't they going to have to interact with people in public and be able to, you know, form coherent sentences and attend meetings and talk to staff? And it's always going to be there. So it's engaging that different learning style that can get lost in an online class. And Finally, it's not just for discussions. You can use this with assignments. You can use this in journals. You can use this in group assignments, you know, where maybe in class we'd have a group presentation. There's no reason they can't do that online. There's no reason that we can't put them into groups and they can get together. They can record a video together. They can upload their video to the discussion board and they can each watch each other's group presentations. And it works great for journals because journals are typically more reflective. And I love telling them, do not make me a script. Just get into your journal, turn the video recorder on and just spitball about how you're feeling, how your student teaching went this week. You know, it's a very emotional time for a lot of teachers. So just hit record, tell me about it, vlog about it. it we're speaking their language sometimes with this. A lot of this generation has grown up on video, you know, with, with TikTok and, and, and vlogging and podcasts, you know, they love that world sometimes. And, and some of them just think it's neat because it's combining something like that they like in their personal life with something, you know, in their career and in their curriculum. So try it with the other things too, not just for discussions. I love this feedback. Um, especially this first one where the student said how she liked being able to complete DQs through video. I know it's a she because we actually had this conversation in person when she personally thanked me at the end of the semester because she said that she was an extremely slow and unfocused reader and that this option was really helpful for her. She said she got more out of these discussions than she ever had just because of the format. And, and then the next person who said that, and, and this is true for me. I'm someone who always reads things out loud after I write them down. And just having them say that listening back to myself speak helped me to remember this information. And that was so 100% me. Like my family thinks I'm crazy. I draft anything and I'm reading it back out loud to myself. Um, and then of course the person that said they'd never been a fan of replying to discussion posts and found it that these were way easier and I completely agree with them how it, it makes it feel more personable and you're able to see and feel the emotions of somebody's words and thoughts. How often do we see that when we're doing something that's written? You know, that that's like the number one worry about writing to someone is that they can't see your face. They can't hear the inflection. People so often take things wrong that are written down because we can't put that emotion into it. And that doesn't happen when you're doing a video discussion, you know, people can see you and, and, and feel it. And it's so, again, so much more engaging and connected because at the end of the day, that's what we really want to come out of our online class is to have our online class not feel sterile. We want it to feel just as lively as what we're doing in person. Okay, any thoughts out there about video discussions and video assignments? I don't see anything in the chat right now. Okie go. Doing well. Okay, video feedback. This is something that I've tried more recently. I've only done this for a few semesters um, and it's gone really well. By video feedback, I mean in your LMS, you probably have something built in where instead of just typing comments to the student in the feedback box, you can record it. And you can either record just your voice or you can do a video recording for them. Um, I started doing these on their, again, their APA papers, because even though you can use the inline grader and, you know, mark it up on the page so they can see it just like you would if we were in person and send it back to them. Think about being in person. They turn in something on a hard copy. We take the red pen. We make all the comments on it. And... I mean, sometimes we just hand it back and, and that's where it ends. But a lot of times, don't we sit there with the student with the hard copy in front of them and talk to them about what's on that piece of paper? And we reinforce the comments that we made and the mistakes and the suggestions, you know, and make sure that they understand it. So it's not a unilateral, I mark it up, I hand it back, it goes into the vortex and we never talk about it again. So 
one semester, I just started to think, what can I do? Because even though I'm giving them all this feedback and all these comments, they still have a million questions about it. And I thought, okay, maybe I can talk them through it. So I would use the inline grader, I'd mark the paper all up, and then I would turn on a screen recording and I would talk about what I just said. And especially again on an APA paper that can make people really cranky and feel bad about themselves. It also gives you the chance to have, you know, that nurturing voice. I know maybe this didn't go as you expected. Let's talk about these things. Let's talk about the good things that are in here. It's almost a little bit of therapy as I'm going through a paper where, you know, I can talk to them about, about that compliment sandwich, you know, the good, the things they need to do, and then wrap it up again with you're trying really hard. I can see that this is really going in a great direction. You know, let me know what questions you have. So for me, it serves a dual purpose because I can see my students start to get frustrated because I remember being that student crying over my APA papers because I was like, I have so much great stuff in here. <laughs> Why am I not doing well? Just because my APA is bad. So um, doing it that way gives it the personal touch. They're still getting the written feedback that I always have on there, but I can make a little bit of a screen recording and talk them through the feedback. And I've noticed that that has dramatically cut down the amount of emails I get after I send the assignments back, either from students asking for clarifications or the students acting like, you know, they think that they're the worst thing to ever hit the world of education because, you know, they don't know APA yet. So it's really cutting down on both sides of that coin, on the technical questions and the emotional support questions. And again, screen record these for even more clarity and talking about screen recordings, lack of closed captions can be an issue. So while I just sat here and told you that there is that usually a recording button, I know for us inside Canvas, inside Blackboard, we can do those. Those do not have closed captions as it stands. So here's where we could go back to Screencast-O-Matic or Screencastify, use either of those, and then just upload it as an attachment into the feedback box. So this is up to you and student preference. Sometimes I'll talk to mine ahead of time. Do you use the closed captions? If they don't, then I'll take the shortcut, use the built-in one. If it's somebody, again, like my daughter who would say, I always want the closed captions on, then I would go and I would make the recording through Screencast-O-Matic, turn the captions on and just attach it to the feedback box as a file. So if you're going to use the video feedback, just be cognizant of the closed captioning issue and make the decision that works best for you and for your students. Um, okay, so while I'm talking about this video feedback, since I do have a couple minutes, I just wanna share one of my favorite yet most heartbreaking stories of a student that I had who grew up in the Middle East and her father did not prioritize women in education. She always says she was lucky enough to be educated. However, if she came home with anything less than perfection, her father would always threaten to remove her because if she wasn't going to do it perfect, she shouldn't be there at all. In his opinion, she shouldn't have been there at all anyway. You know, it was a gift that she was going. And if she was not to do it to perfection, then there was no point in her being there. So... She struggled in my course with APA format. And as she struggled with the format, she so struggled with herself because she still carried that baggage that her father had put on her. She had left home. She had been living in Canada for 10 years already. She was an older student, a non-traditional coming back for a second career, um, finally having the confidence to be that educated woman that she always wanted to be and to go out and be the kind of teacher she had always wished that she had. But she still really struggled with making mistakes. And I soon learned that I needed to give her the video feedback and how important it was for her to hear my voice when she made mistakes. Because in her head, when she made a mistake, the only voice she ever heard was her father's. And it was so critical for her to hear me. 
and to hear me say, nobody's perfect. If you knew it, you wouldn't be in my class. I don't expect you to know all of these things. And, and if you knew it all, heck, I wouldn't have a job. I'm here to teach it to you. And it's okay that that's what we need to do. So for her, it was so crucial for her to hear my voice instead of the voice in her head as she got assignments back. And that was when I really realized the difference that this method could take. And then at the end of the semester, when she turned in her student opinion survey, one of my questions on there is always, what was the most important thing that you learned this semester? And her answer was, I learned that my grades do not define me. I learned that I am enough. So right there, I thought, I'm going to use video feedback forever because that was the greatest thing that I could have ever heard come out of her mouth. Um, I did not include that one in here because that would not have made any sense without my story. Um, but as far as the feedback that I have received for video feedback, the one student called it the most helpful feedback that they received in any of their courses throughout the semester. Um, how the video feedback um, makes it feel more personal. And the last one, um, how it's not just words written online and it allowed me to explain things, which was super helpful. So this just validates all of the things that I hoped would come out of providing the video feedback. Um, it really did seem to do its job. Okay, and then we have one last bonus slide for bonus assignments because I love giving bonus assignments in my class. In case I haven't mentioned it, I teach APA and I like to give them bonus assignments to earn some points back. Anytime they get something wrong and they're beating themselves up, I'm like, we'll put a bonus assignment. You can earn some of those points back. I'm not gonna you know, wimp out and not mark you off for it, but I will give you a ch chance to earn it back in some other way. So one of the bonus assignments I love to put out there is to have them record a video or a TikTok and put it in our bonus discussion because it gives them a chance just to do something fun. And I usually do it, I'm actually throwing it out to my class next week. It's, it's our right around our midterm time. And I they have a midterm break and I'll say, take the midterm break, rediscover your family. And while you're rediscovering your family, do a bonus assignment for our class. And I tell them, you know, grab your friends, grab your family, get your pets, record a video and just put it in that we can all laugh at and bond over and have a good time. So the first one is me dancing in my driveway with my daughter and a student that we were hosting from Trinidad, um, who I'm proud to say stayed here. He's at Buff State right now. Um, and we're just dancing in our driveway. And I always put it in as a sample. And then there was the student who did one with their dogs. There's a, one of my students dancing with her brothers. Um, so they could be anything. They're just silly ways to, uh, like I always tell them, rediscover your family, connect with each other, throw it in for a couple extra points. I have them do, I have them put in memes and like we do all sorts of silly things for bonus assignments because it's kind of my mental health break for them because they really need it in this course because statistics and APA aren't really intrinsically fun. So that's just a way that we can use a video as a bonus assignment. And I did that honestly because I was at a workshop about Generation Z and things that connect with Generation Z and they challenged us to use TikTok in our teaching. And so darn it, I did it and it's worked pretty well for me. Um, so there is a bonus video idea, um, which brings us to your turn. Um, how can you use videos? How do you use videos in your teaching? Anybody out there have anything that they want to share or ask? And they can open up their mic as well to, to do that, right, Juliana? Um, yes, I don't know how you guys have this set up. Can we unmute them? <laughs> they can open their mics. If not, you can put it in the chat. I do. Or you can put it in the chat. A which one. I can't see, so. <laughs> <laughs> I see we have one comment in the chat that um, Daniel is not sure if TikTok is allowable in their state PC resources. And yes, and that that is a thing. That's why I always say video or TikTok because I do, I have, and I have students that are on TikTok and I have a few say, I can't go down that rabbit hole. I can't even open up an account. <laughs> so, so they just post a video, <laughs> um, which I, I love. I actually had um, 
he was a performer once he was an actor turned um wanted to become a, a fine arts teacher and he recorded a video of him tap dancing and the video was just his feet and it was the greatest thing ever <laughs> so so yes it doesn't have to be a tiktok it can just be a video of them doing something creative with their family just uh just uh, really it's a stress reliever Okay, anything else out there? I miraculously ended with five entire minutes and that never happens. <laughs> um, okay, I guess if there's nothing out there, then my challenge to you is just to go one step further. If you've already used videos in your class, see if you can go one step further. What else can you use or how else can you have your students use it? I am not pretending that I did all of these things at the same time. I've been teaching online for longer than I want to admit because I like to pretend I'm not that old, but I've been teaching online since 2006. And back in 2006, we had very little idea what we were doing. We were building the field as we went along. So I don't pretend that all these things happened. Um, the video announcements were really the first thing that I started with. And then probably I added in the course navigation video after that. And then they just success come in through the years with video feedback being my latest one. So um, don't overwhelm yourself. Don't feel like you have to implement all these things immediately. Find something that you think is within your repertoire and would work for your students and for your skill level. And, and just start there because the most important thing we want to do is maintain those connections with our students. And what better way to do that than to actually feel like we're real people with faces and voices and personalities, if nothing else, then just as that touch point. Let them see who you authentically are. Like I said, I am a goofball and that works for me. But if you're not, it's just going to be creepy. So go with what works for you because that's what your students want to do. They want to get to know you and they want to benefit from your expertise. And this is your platform to really let that come across. We did have a that comment. is my closing message. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We did have a comment in the uh, chat that says, uh, thank you. I've used videos for many lectures, first week discussions and tour of the course. However, I'm going to incorporate announcement videos for each Canvas module. Yay, one step further, good for you. <laughs> and great that you've been vid using videos so much. So I'm sure you can attest to all these things I've been saying on how successful they could be and what a difference they really make. Yeah. Um, Juliana, if you will stop sharing, I'm going to share I will. the screen of the uh, certificate that we can get um, if you want to show that you've been in on this. I'm not going to put that up on here. Oops. Put this over here for a second. Okay. Can everyone see that? I see it. Okay. I'm not sure which screen I'm sharing here, but well, I see my name on there, so it's got to be the right one. Okay. Okay, Juliana, we want to thank you so much for this talk. That was great, and I always enjoy listening to you. And you have so many ideas that are are interesting to try. Um, if you have any questions, I'm sure Juliana can. Uh, can answer them and if you want to get her, um, if we want to put her uh, email in the address in the chat, Wendy, I'm not sure I have that for her. I do. Okay. <laughs> I know my email address. I'm going to put that screen up again here. Okay, as soon as that's out. And I have shared my slide deck. So um, in case you all want to look at my face more. Yeah, and we will send everything, we'll send that all out too in the follow-up mail. Oops. Stop sharing there. Okay. So did, did you Thank say that you, you're going to send the certificate? 
Yeah, you can take a, a screenshot of the certificate if you'd like. I'll put that up again. Okay. see somehow I've lost my screen share here. Okay. okay, any other questions you have for Juliana? Well, thanks for coming. And thanks to everybody watching the video later. Yes, and thank you, Juliana. I hope your ice storm doesn't plow you under there. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and thanks, Juliana. Thank you thank all you, for joining us today. Okay, thank you.